Well, the Fourier transform and the discrete time Fourier transform have a very powerful property when it comes to convolution. And we've used that repeatedly where we have a convolution in the time domain and we can convert that to multiplication of the transforms in the frequency domain. So the question we have here is whether the DFT shares that same kind of property that if we convolve things in the time domain we end up with multiplication in the frequency domain. We're going to look at that. We're going to approach it from the standpoint of multiplying the DFT coefficients and then exploring what happens to the signal in the time domain. So I'm going to define a quantity y tilde of k which is the product of two sets of DFT coefficients x of k and h of k with each of those being length n. I can therefore write the expression for y tilde of n, the time domain signal, using the inverse DFT of y tilde of k, which is just h of k times x of k, as I've written here. For h of k, we're going to substitute the discrete time for a transform expression to write this in terms of h of m. Next, we're going to interchange the summations and collect some terms so we can write what we had up here as the sum from m equals 0 to n minus 1 of h of m times this term in square brackets here, which is just 1 over n, the sum k equals 0 to n minus 1, x of k, e to the j 2 pi k n, times e to the j 2 pi k m divided by capital N. And these are familiar terms to us. We can recognize that this expression is the inverse discrete time for a transform of x of k. And that gives us the periodically extended signal x of n with the period being n. Remember, we were, this was a sampling in frequency of the DTFT, and consequently we had a sum of shifted replicates in time which we denoted by this double parentheses notation with a subscript n. The multiplication by e to the j 2 pi over n times km is just a modulation in frequency which corresponds to a shift in time. So we've got a shift in time here and therefore we end up with the y tilde being expressed as a sum from m equals 0 to n minus 1 of h of m times x of n minus m periodically extended with period n. So what we've shown is that y tilde in the frequency domain being the product of DFT coefficients hk and xk has inverse DFT y tilde of n given by the sort of convolution but it's a, it's a convolution with h of m and then this periodic version of x of n. Now we're going to denote this using a different symbol than we've used for convolution before because this is a slightly different form of convolution. So we're going to put a circle with a capital N in the center to denote that this is an n-periodic convolution. These are known as circular convolutions and it corresponds to convolving H with an n-periodic extension of X of N where we have those shifted replicates that overlap. So our property for the DFT with respect to convolution and multiplication is that indeed we have a convolution that converts to through the DFT multiplication of coefficients however it's a slightly different convolution than we've worked with in the past and in general this n periodic convolution or this circular convolution is not going to be the same as the ordinary convolution of H and X and that's a fact that we're going to explore in more detail. So I want to recall that this n periodic extension of x can be written as a sum of shifted replicates where the shift is capital N and the original signal is x of n. So I can expand this circular convolution using this representation and write it as h of n ordinary convolution with the sum from L equals minus infinity to infinity of x of n minus L times cap n. Now I can move the sum outside of the convolution and write that I have a sum of h of n convolved with shifted version of x of n. Well since 
convolution commutes with the shift operation, I can simplify the expression. I'm going to let y of n be the convolution of h and x, the ordinary convolution, and then I see that what I have with this circular convolution is I get the equivalent of a sum of shifted replicates of ordinary convolution. The problem is, in terms of this being different from ordinary convolution, is that if the duration of y of n exceeds n, capital N, then these shifted replicates will overlap and I can't identify y of n from y tilde of n. On the other hand, if the duration of y of n is less than or equal to n, then I can obtain y of n from y tilde of n. Because I just pick out one period. In order to use the circular convolution to compute an ordinary convolution, in other words, in order to multiply DFT coefficients and then take an inverse DFT and extract an ordinary convolution, we have to have some constraints then on the length n that we choose. So let's suppose that x of n is duration m sub x and h of n is duration m sub h. Then if you check the ordinary convolution x and h, which we've called y, it turns out that that has duration m sub y is equal to m sub x plus m sub h minus 1. And I've kind of sketched that out here. Remember, you can do convolution by uh, fixing one of the sequences and then flipping and shifting the other sequence past. So here I've shown h as being fixed, and I flipped and shifted x and indicated the durations. And if you figure out when these non-zero parts overlap, it's for a duration of m sub y, which is the sum of the two individual durations minus 1. So if I choose the length of my DFT, or n, to exceed this sum of the two durations minus 1, then I can get y of n from the circular convolution y tilde of n. Now we're going to look at an example, and we're going to do three things here. We're going to first compute the ordinary or linear convolution, then we'll compute the circular convolution with a value of capital N too small so that we can't recover the linear convolution. And then we'll choose a larger value of capital N and show that indeed we do get the linear convolution. So I've chosen some simple sequences here. They both have length capital N equals 3. And we've got x of n at time 0 is 1, at time 1 is 2, and at time 3 is 3. h of n is going to be 1 at 0, 0 at 1, and a value of 2 at time n equals 2. So if I write the ordinary or linear convolution, h convolved with x as the sum of h of m times x of n minus m, and I do this graphically, I'm going to graph h of m, and then we'll flip and shift x so that what was at time 0 in x now occurs at time n. And then we'll allow n to vary and compute the product of these two signals, which is what's under the sum here, it's the product. So we'll vary n, compute the product for each value of n, and then we'll add up the values in that signal to get the linear convolution. Well, if I start with n less than 0, then these two signals don't overlap. x of n minus m is shifted far enough to the left that it doesn't overlap. So I get exactly 0 for n less than 0. Then when y for n equals 0, it turns out that this value here of 1 overlaps with the 1 here, and I have 1 times 1, which is 1. Then when n equals 1, I'm going to have the value of 1 in x overlaps with 0 in h, and then I have 2 in x that overlaps with 1 in h, so I have 2 times 1, and I get a value of 2. Then when n is equal to 2, I have the value 1 in x lines up with 2, the value 2 in h, and the value 3 in x lines up with the value 1 in h. And when I multiply then, 3 times 1 plus 2 times 1, I get 5. And when similarly, when n is equal to 3, I end up with just 2 times 2 here and get 4. When n is equal to to 4, I have this value 3 overlapping with this value 2, so I've got 3 times 2 is 6, and then for n greater than 5, 
I find that there's no overlap anymore, so that's exactly zero. Now to do the circular convolution, we're going to do this case for capital N equals 3, which is the duration of each of these two signals. The way to do circular convolution is to do it the same way, but instead of using the signal x, we're going to do con linear convolution or ordinary convolution with a periodically extended version of x with period capital N equals 3. So I've drawn the same signals here. I've got h of m, and then I've got a periodic version of x shifted to time n. So my value, which was at 0, which was 1 in my original signal, and you see up here I had 1 at time 0, that's going to be located at time n. So we'll do the same thing as we did before. We're going to multiply this sequence times this one and sum up all the values to get the convolution y tilde. Well, in this case, you see right away, because of this periodic extension, that y tilde of n is not 0 when n is less than 0. And if we look at y tilde of 0, which before we had 1, now we end up at time 0, we've got this value of 1 lining up with 1. So I've got 1 times 1, but then I have this value of 2 lining up with this value of 2, plus 2 times 2, so 1 plus 4 is 5. And when n is equal to 1, I end up with 2 times 1 here, plus 3 times 2. So that's 2 plus 6, which is 8. And so on. You can go on and, and calculate these values just doing the same procedure, and we get quite a different answer than we had for y. y tilde is not equal to y, with capital N being equal to 3. And we said in our derivation a few minutes ago that if I chose N large enough, that I could get the values of y tilde and y to overlap. So here what I'm going to do is choose capital N to be equal to the sum of the durations of the two sequences h and x minus 1. So that's going to be 3 plus 3 minus 1, which is 5. If I choose n at least 5, I should be able to find y of n from y tilde. And so here we've redrawn this with n equal 5, and now you see that my periodic extension of x has some zeros in between the individual repetitions of x. And when I do my convolution, well, I still don't have y tilde of n equal 0 when n is less than 0, but in the interval from 0 to 4, I end up getting the same values that I got for y. And we can look at this to see how this works. For 0, when n is equal to 0, this 1 value here lines up with this one. So I have 1 times 1 and get 1. When n is equal to 2, I shift this over 1 unit, and I have the 2 value here lining up with the 1 value here, and I get 2. 2 times 1. When I have n equal 2, I have the value of 1 lining up with this value of 2 in h, and then the value of 3 in x lines up with the 1 in h, so I have 3 times 1 plus 2 times 1, which is 5. And then when I get to 3 for n, I have that 2 lines up with 2 here in h, and consequently I get a 4, and then I'll stop at n equals 4. When I have n equals 4, this value of 3 in x lines up with this value of 2 in h, and I end up with 6, and then you could continue this process. But the point of all of this is that in the interval from 0 to 4, which is the five non-zero samples of y of n, I found that y tilde is exactly equal to y. And so y of n had duration 5, and the non-zero values were y of 0 through y of 4. And in this case, when n is equal to 5, I get y of n being equal to y tilde of n for indices 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. So I can recover y of n from y tilde of n. Now one of the reasons that we're spending a lot of time discussing this relationship between the ordinary convolution and convolution based on the DFT, the product of the DFT coefficients, is it turns out there's a very numerically efficient way to evaluate the DFT and consequently multiplying DFT coefficients and taking an inverse transform is actually less expensive in many cases 
than doing the ordinary linear convolution. And we'll discuss this more fully as we go on. The convolution property for the DFT plays a very important role in numerical use of the DFT in signal processing.